Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, I thank you so much for joining us all tonight. Um, I'm very excited that Carmen um, Jarrera is joining us tonight. There she is already. Boy, she's quick. <laughs> no lag <laughs> time. Pop. Hello. No lag time. Poof. <laughs> Hello, well, hello. thank you for joining us, Carmen. Thank you for having me. Always love to virtually or in person be with, with Baker Bookhouse. So thank you. And yeah, you know that you always got a standing invite with us, either in the store or here on virtually. So um, and I was just telling you earlier, and I'll admit it here on screen, is I just finished this a short time ago. So um I really liked it. So tell us a little bit about pretty little pieces. Yeah, so Pretty Little Pieces is my, I guess it's still new. It's, it came out in, yeah. in, I forgot when it came out, December, <laughs> December 4th. Oh, it's almost March. It's not that new. Um, feels new to me. But uh, yes, Pretty Little Pieces came out in December. It is my second book with Bethany House. For those who are not familiar with me, I'm very new. Um, my first book was called After She Falls. Maybe you saw it around. Chris actually interviewed me about that one as well. Um, that was about a Cuban mixed martial artist, sort of classic underdog story, um, but you know, contemporary Christian romance, a light homage to Rocky, um, much different, very different from Pretty Little Pieces. Kind of wanted to show you I've got some range, guys. I can do different things. So where After She Falls was sort of this like a little darker, a little heavier read. Um, Pretty Little Pieces is definitely lighter. Uh, it still has some depth, um, but the premise of Pretty Little Pieces is there's this gal named Georgina Havoc, and she is the next Joanna Gaines. For those who are not familiar with Joanna Gaines, you know, she's the she's the home makeover queen and she does all things aesthetic like cookbooks and clothes and products and she's a beautiful family. So Georgina is sort of like this next perfect person and her life all sort of instantly falls apart um at the at the very beginning of the story and without you know like we just said it's been out for a little while so we probably can't avoid some spoilers but uh it's essentially a story about a woman rebuilding her life um but in a bunch of ways that she could have never seen coming um through things that seem very much like problems that end up being like it's not tidy um but it's 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 satisfying a satisfying um makeover i guess yeah the, the book itself is sort of yeah. a, you know metaphor of rebuilding yeah that's a good way for the um to say that a makeover so yeah. um i gotta ask because it was one of the things um that when I kind of was getting to the end of the book. So you have the Georgina just before everything starts falling apart. Right. Do you think she would have liked the Georgina if they had met? Oh, you know, the... that's a really good question. You stumped me. I don't know. No one's asked me that yet. Uh, would like Georgina at the beginning, like Georgina at the end? Yeah. Um, you know, I think Georgina at the beginning would have, wouldn't necessarily really even have a category for Georgina at the end, you know, like, I don't know if she would have disliked her, but I don't think she could have imagined herself, imagined someone like that, um, which I think that's maybe true sometimes of like all of us who are Christians, um, where it's hard to sort of like, if you compare yourself not even like pre-Christian and post-Christian, but just different points along the Christian journey, you're sort of like, whoa. <laughs> like, I don't know, like sort of for good or bad reasons, um, depends on how it's going, I guess. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think that Georgina at the be at the end would have a much gentler and more nuanced perception of, Georgina at the beginning, you know, I think Georgina at the beginning is pretty all or nothing, you know, like, um, high intensity, uh, focused on exactly what she wants. And so I think that Georgina at the end would have a, have a very different perspective on, you know, why she was operating like that and 
who that, who that girl really was and why she was like that. Good answer, by the way. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank yeah, you. I didn't warn you about that one. That was one I, um, Put me I thought spot. after I sent you the cute little list. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. So, I like surprise. It, Thank you. And um, so what is the takeaway you want your readers, you know, to take away? Ugh. Yeah, yeah. Um, this book. Oh, I gotcha. I know what you mean. So I was thinking about this. This was on the list you asked me. And so I try to be kind of careful about not being overly focused on the takeaway. I do okay. think there has to be a transformation. And so you need to think about what that will be when you're writing a story. And so like hearkening back to your last question, you do have to think about like, how do these people change? Um, because that's what makes it satisfying. If they don't change, then it's not going to feel like you really went on a journey with them. So obviously there's lots of changes that take place in a lot of the characters over the course of the story. The main thing that I hope for like what people come away with reading Pretty Little Pieces is I hope they're very entertained. I hope it feels like, you know, the fun of watching a design show and a chick flick and a rom-com. I hope it's all those like fun things, but simultaneously, I hope they're also like inspired to just think about things going on in their life, you know, just a little bit differently. I think the average modern woman, millennial woman, um, probably thinks about things in a way very similar to the way that Georgina does, um, at the beginning at least. Um, so that's, that's kind of the goal is that combination of just entertain you, take you on a fun story, but also when it's done, you know, to think, think about things like, uh, chemistry and art and, television shows and creativity and, and just kind of, you know, leave the reader with fun things to, to think through as they live their own story. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> I, um, and I think it tells that you don't go in with like, well, this is a book about forgiveness. You know, yeah, this yeah. Is you know, that doesn't usually go well. Like, I appreciate that. I appreciate that people want to do that. Um, and you know, like I, I don't, I'm very open about being a Christian and my books are very Christian. There's no, you can't read it and be like, oh, I wonder if this is Christian or not. Like, it's very obvious. Um, but I do think that art and fiction is not supposed to be like a lesson. And so you want to. I mean, I, I think it teaches lessons, but I think you approach it not like that. It's it's art. It's primarily art. So, you know, there should be this fun and this sort of um you're not you're not bound by such tight rules when you're right. working with art, you know. I'm not okay. I'm not teaching you a lesson, I'm telling you a story. It's a different <laughs> thing. So Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm going to, this was something else that um, as I start, I re, I forgot I had thought this, otherwise I would have included it. So I do apologize that, but so I'm going to throw one at you that because the way your book starts um, isn't quite the typical way a Christian book starts. Um, right. You know, they are, um, Georgina and um, Lance are obviously living together. Right. Um, and I can remember, okay, and it doesn't, bother me but my person in my head who I have to work with customers goes uh oh <laughs> yeah and you know what I have such a hard time understanding it because I mean I understand like oh no I, I don't I, I shouldn't say I understand I don't because <laughs> you know we live we live in the in a world where yes as a Christian like I feel compelled and convicted to do certain things a certain way but I'm under no illusion that everyone around me is also doing that or thinking that, or, you know, like I, and like, I'm also very aware of like, just statistically the likelihood of, of these two people, like, of course they live together. And I'm not saying of course they live together because it's good. Uh, I think there's actually, I mean, there's a, a lot of whether you're religious or not, there's a lot of information, good information about why cohabitating could be very disastrous for you. Um, but I mean, I just know from observing being a human being, being a young woman, like what is realistic? I had a similar 
you know, criticisms about after she falls, um, the male character in after she falls is not a Christian at the beginning of the book. And he's like promiscuous to a certain extent. I mean, not as promiscuous as he could be, but he is promiscuous. And a lot of people were mad about that. And I, my response is a 20 something year old, non-Christian, very attractive professional fighter. Like, of course he's sleeping with people. And, you know, and my book doesn't go into like all of these like saucy details about it, but it's, it's just, we're, if we're going to tell stories, at least for me, I can't pretend like people don't do things that people do, <laughs> you know, like I just, I don't, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, I don't know how that helps anything in Christian fiction to pretend as if people don't sleep together before they're married. People don't sleep with lots of people. Like, I mean, it's just, that has been true. It's true of the modern moment. It's been true of human history. Obviously it's looked a little bit different across the ages, but like, yeah, I, I, I totally respect someone's decision. If their preference is they don't want books like that. Um, but that's, I mean, what I write is what I try to make it. i try to make it feel like you're, you're, watching real people and so that includes that includes things that you might not want them to do (laughs) you know like just does like yeah and I and I agree with that I I hope I didn't imply that I was upset about it because I wasn't no no no. I understood what you were saying right because I it was just it's so funny because um when I listen I listen to audios on the way back and forth to work and, it, and I listen to books that I wouldn't normally carry in the store so I can keep, you know, you keep your finger in the pies here. And, and once in a while something happens and I'm like, oh, that's not a good, oh wait, that's not a book I'm going to sell anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's like, I understand, like, it's very difficult to walk the line of, um, Like you don't want to glamorize things. Like obviously our culture very much like glamorizes a lot of things that are actually pretty destructive to people. Um, You never want to do that. Um, But at the same time, I'm not really, I guess I don't have this like anxiety about reading about people doing wrong things. Like I, I guess, I don't know. I'm in tune with my own wrongness. I know that it's there. I know like, yeah, I don't know. It just, it doesn't, there is, I mean, obviously I've come across things that I don't enjoy reading. Um, and that's perfectly fine, but. Right. And I, I find that kind of writing where you cross the threshold into the bedroom, so to speak, um, cheap writing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's much harder to write really yeah. fun tension. It's much harder to write chemistry than it is to write a sex scene it's not hard to write a sex scene I mean like I mean okay I should say obviously some are probably better than others like but but like well, that took a turn oh, I just to just to validate what you're saying like really good writing requires some depth and generally um, if you're just going for the very obvious, you know, if it's just littered with swear words, if it's raunchiness, every other, I mean, that's just appealing to the absolute base little like dopamine hit, you know, you're not really doing anything particularly sophisticated. I think when you're, when people write like that, and I don't think it's edifying either. So I, I, you know, but some people categorize my books like that. And I take some offense, obviously. <laughs> like, I don't think that. Somebody said that to me one time that it wasn't like they were saying you like you wrote Fifty Shades of Grey or any of that, right. but they were like, it, it, it's more than what I expected. And I said, this one is a good case of that where, um, okay, here's a spoiler. So plug your ears if you haven't read the book, but <laughs> where Georgina is the pursuer of, Cassidy. Right. And I found that fascinating because so often, you know, the cliche is, is here's the non-Christian guy and the girl's trying to stay pure. And we're right. here. It was the girl going, well, what do you mean? You don't want to sleep with me. I'm insulted. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that was, I thought that was such an interesting part of the story. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to, 
explore that dynamic a little bit because in after she falls it did it was the more uh, like you know she was a baby believer and he wasn't and there was like lots of conflict over that and so I thought it would be more interesting to do a um like actual fairly mature I mean I don't suggest that Cassidy is like this you know he's not like Saint Paul or something but he's obviously got like a very he's got some solid faith it's been tested by hard things um and Georgina is like nominal you know like she's not she's not actually a Christian but she's very like you know sort of just that the air you breathe when you're born in the United States and you have nominally religious parents like she's one of those people and I was like that would be that's an interesting thing to to consider like how does the relationship between those two kinds of people play out um and you know I obviously I kind of have like my own experiences to draw on my husband was a more mature believer than I was when we met yeah um but, you know, and in different times, I think I have been more mature than him. So, like, it's sort of this, like, pulling from that and then just observing, you know, as a writer, it's your job to observe people, um, learn things, take things, take good things and bad things and turn them into into stories and people and more yeah. them in fiction. So, <laughs> Well, that was quite a good and interesting rabbit trail, but it was, like I said, as I was finishing this book up, those were some of the things I'd been thinking about. So. Yeah, no, those um, are good. Sorry, I get, I get passionate about the, because, you know, like I never really set out to be, uh, obviously when I wrote a book about an MMA, uh, a, a mixed martial artist, that was considered edgy. And I knew that, um, but I didn't think I would, I didn't think I was edgy like, for the content that it was like, you know, more, more sexy or more whatever. Like I didn't know that going in. And so that has been con- consistently criticism or praised. Um, and so I've just, I've just embraced it. And it's become, it's become a hot topic for me is, you know, I don't know. Let's write Everybody's books. Everybody's asking now. Right about, let's write books about people who are real. Yeah. <laughs> real you know, I, you know what? And I, I, those are my favorite. Um, cause that's the one thing I thought of all the way through this book was this feels like life, um, where something major happens and you're, all she go is, okay, I get to the end of this and go back to normal, but then it's something else. And then it's something else. And then it's, you know, and it just, there's never normal again, because it's your new normal. Yeah. But it, you know, and Georgina had that a lot. It was like every time she turned around, there was something else going on. And I was exhausted for her because <laughs> we've all been there. So yeah, so yeah. Maybe in some ways I thought you were being mean, but <laughs> yeah, you know, it really is true. Writing advice, you put them through as much as you possibly can. That's what generally makes a good story. You think of every bad thing that can happen to them <laughs> and make that happen to them. Don't be very yeah. nice. You won't have a lot. To I'm sorry. Oh, so you won't have enough to work with if you don't really <laughs> put them put them through the ringer. Yep. So we've talked about Georgina quite a bit. Um, I love that she was a strong woman, yet very natural. When things happened, she kind of fell apart. So, but tell me about Cassidy. A fascinating name. I I love that was a thing in the book too. So yeah. tell me where you got the idea for that. But what? Where was the idea from him come from, or is he based on somebody you know? So other people have asked me this, and this is embarrassing, but I think it's, I because I was pregnant and postpartum and I was rewriting it, I don't remember. <laughs> I honestly don't remember. <laughs> but I've been racking my brain and I, I have clues. Um, so I, I read a lot of magazines online or in print. Um, I just like, I like fashion magazines. I like home decor magazines. I like food magazines, just something. I don't know. I read them a lot when I was growing up and I just enjoy the experience of like beautiful photography and they always have weird names for every, you know, like the products are always named after people like makeup products or, or new furniture, like colors, like, and they're always interesting names they're not ever just like you know a standard kind of name there are names like Cassidy and Georgina and Poppy you know and so I think I draw a lot of 
just natural inspiration from having read a lot of stuff like that. Trendy names, um, stylish names. That's kind of what I go for. I think just because of that particular inspiration, you know, him being based off of a particular person, I, how I started it out was I, I knew Georgina, I had her decided. And so then I think I just thought, who's the opposite? And that is how he was slowly built. So he's not based off of a particular person. The closest inspiration would be, um, it's actually mentioned in the book, uh, the machine gun preacher. <laughs> um, that's like an actually very good movie I'm very critical of Christian movies I generally don't think they're very good and I don't even know if Machine Gun Preacher is considered a Christian movie um, but it's about a real guy who was a Christian okay. um, who had a ministry running guns to um, Nigerians I believe being slaughtered that was his ministry. He got them guns so that they could protect their families and their children. Um, and it stars Gerard Butler. So it's got like a star oh, study. Well, now I got to look it up. You got to watch <laughs> it. It's really good. Um, that's the closest person that I can think of to a Cassidy. Um, and that came, you know, like I, that inspiration rings true because I really appreciated that this guy, you know, like generally when we think of Christian men, pious Christian men, you don't think of somebody who makes it their mission to get machine guns to people. Like it's very like kind of disorienting. But I think when you really ponder that, like what a super loving thing to do. These people live in constant fear. They're constantly terrorized. They have no one to help them. And this one guy makes it like his life's mission at the risk of his own life all the time to help them. And so I think that's actually a really interesting picture of Christ. Um, so that's kind of where I think Cassidy was probably spawned. <laughs> and that does make sense when you say it, because I meant to look that movie up and I totally forgot because I kept reading and then, yeah. well, you know, oh, if, I'm not, if I don't do it immediately and I don't write it down, there's no shot. So yeah, no, you got to watch it. It's good. It's really okay. good. I will have to do that. So but you brought up an interesting topic here and you addressed it in the book a bit. Um, Georgina and Cassidy, one of the big things they argue over is his job, which right. was you know, military and sniper. And then he's now going off to a war zone where he's going to shoot people. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I thought that was an interesting conversation. Well, there's several of course, but um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I am interested, that's probably, um, that's a little bit of me and my personal interests coming through. I think the conversation of Christian pacifism is really fascinating. Um, and so I wanted, I just wanted a moment <laughs> to be like, I want to hear these two people talk about it <laughs> because yeah. they obviously would have different perspectives. Like it makes sense why they would. Um, and I think, you know, because like I said, I, I do think that picture of the machine gun preacher is a picture that I wish more Christians were familiar with. Not because I think every Christian is going to be like that, like I, obviously not, um, but because I think sometimes we're too quick to decide that that's not Christian or that's not, you know, that in, I think if you think about it a little bit harder it's not that easy to come to that conclusion. You know what I mean? It's not, yeah. it's, it's not that straightforward to say, as a Christian, you should never shoot someone. It's like, um, there's a lot of instances, the vast majority of the time you should not be shooting someone, but as it's raised yeah. in the book, as it's raised in the movie, um, there are instances where like, if you're protecting another person, uh, particularly someone more vulnerable than you, I mean, I think that that's the Christian ethic. Um, and, you know, I didn't want to be, the book is not about that. And so it's not this whole like lecture or anything. Um, but I thought those, I'm glad you enjoyed those conversations. I thought they were, thought they were thought provoking and fun because obviously mixed into it is like sexual tension and like, you know, questions of whether these two people are going to end up together. And so that's the way to do it. In my opinion, if you're going to bring up a really, hot topic <laughs> make it a little bit 
you know, shrouded and other things so that the reader can just kind of enjoy it. And then they can think about it on their own. Like, what do I think? Do I think that Christians should be snipers? Um, do I think there's an ethical issue with that? Same, kind of the same thing with um, After She Falls. Some people believe that um, professional fighting is inherently not Christian. Right. Strong, I strongly disagree. Um, so yeah, I think probably what comes out in those two things is just my personal interest in the question of, I don't think that being a Christian automatically necessitates passivity or pacifism. And so kind of letting that play out in realistic scenarios. Yeah. And I know it's something people will, well, forever wrestle with. I mean, yeah. but I think what I liked about the conversations they both had together was towards the end, it was an agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to like what you do, but I also see that it fulfills you, you know, because right. She mentions that at way at the end. I don't even know where, but anyways, like I see that he's happier when he has a, a mission, a, a, a job to do. Right. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, like I said, you gave both sides of the issue fair play. It wasn't yeah. like, well, I'm gonna make her feel stupid or he's going to suddenly go, oh, you're right. Let me throw my gun down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Somebody should have said that. So. Yeah. So at the end, I was like, it was a hard to write the ending of that book, but I felt like there was a lot of really beautiful compromise, like as it, as it played out. I was, yeah. happy. I didn't know necessarily that that was where it was going to go. And so when it did, I was like, good job, me too. <laughs> well done. <laughs> You got your act together just in time. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, well, good. And I have to admit, I did play the game of, do I know any other Cassidy's? I do know <laughs> one, but it's a girl, so it didn't count, I guess. But well, you know, it was originally, like many names, it was a male's, a male name, like, uh, I think, was it Allison? Like, a, originally a men, a male, a men's, a, ma a man's name. What am I trying to say here? Be. Yeah. I think yeah, so Cassidy, I know, was was originally for men and then dominated. Women took over, as Georgina <laughs> points out. <laughs> I have to admit the the two guys I thought of were like Butch Cassidy and then um, Sean Cassidy. I'm like, well, that doesn't work. Both of those are last. <laughs> no, I wasn't really just doing it. great with it either. But <laughs> I wish I had a cooler reason. I just liked it. That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, and it was the, you know, it, they become their names very quickly, you know. Right, right, yeah. So and it wasn't any problem. It just made me giggle because every once in a while I was off going, do you know a guy with that name? <laughs> so there you go. Maybe if it becomes wildly popular, we'll have a surge in boys named Cassidy. We'll just, okay, we'll look <laughs> we'll for that. It, link it back to Pretty Little Pieces. <laughs> <laughs> look, we started the trend. Yes. So you have unashamedly said, I love writing romances. Um, I believe there was something somewhere at Fiction Reader Summit about, you know, cool guys and give me Jesus or give me a, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, my book now. Hot, hot guys, happy endings, Jesus. I think that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so we're going with this framework. Yep. But you add these interesting topics to it, you know, because with um, After She Falls is the, there was a lot going on there too, but that abuse story and the, of it happening, but also the recovery from it. This right. one, there's a lot in this one, um, you know, miscarriages and drug abuse, and we were just talking about guns and things like that. So how do you get these topics to flow nicely with what, we normally think of as a lighter thing, a romance story. How do you get those two to work together well? Well, you rewrite it 18 <laughs> times. <laughs> That's what I did with Pretty Little. Oh, is that all? <laughs> you rewrite it until you feel like you're going to die. <laughs> Just, um, but kind of. I'm pretty sure everybody now wants to be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the best. <laughs> it's good. It's a really good question. Um, so usually what I do 
is well i will say it is true you do have to do multiple iterations because okay. first few are just going to be rough if you're trying to do you know things seamlessly which is i is important to me i want it to feel i don't ever want someone to like stutter over anything i just kind of want it to move you do have to probably write it at least five times just because it takes that many at least for, maybe other people don't need that but i need that to just take out extra stuff and you know like i'm sure you've probably talked to writers about like killing your darlings you know that whole thing you have to do that you always start with all this stuff that you think is so funny and you think is so cute and whatever and it maybe it is um but the goal is for that smooth experience and that just requires a lot of ruthless editing um if it doesn't move the story forward if it doesn't do something it shouldn't be in there that's kind of the rule that i have for myself of like if it's not introducing the reader to something that they need to know or they want to know if it's not um pushing this forward in a way where now we have another problem then it doesn't need to be in there almost everything needs to be like creating the next problem um just for that like momentum and then, you know, romance is really interesting because to write a romance all by itself is not that complicated because okay. all you're doing is putting these people in as many situations as you can where you're answering the question of, are they going to end up together? And a good romance is... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Over and over and over again until the very end. Um, that's ideal. So that part's easier, I think. I mean, but to me, to make those scenes interesting, you need all these problems. Otherwise, I mean, if you don't have a bunch of problems, then really all you have is two people who are like attracted to each other and, you know, like each other just kind of dancing around each other if there's actual like high stakes if there's issues going on if there's stuff if we've got baggage if we've got exes if we've got addictions if we've got you know like just things that people actually do have <laughs> you know most of us when we approach romance we approach it with a lot of um complication generally not always some people you know it's more simple it's more straightforward but who wants to read that you know <laughs> like let's just be real like you, you want you pick up a book because you want it to be um you want to be entertained and so there has to be this sort of tension there but yeah for me you can't really have one without the other because romance as much as I do love it just all by itself is not very satisfying if they don't have to work for it you know and the problems are what make you work like getting over the things is what makes it feel very satisfying at the end which is why a lot of you know hallmarky stuff to me I'm kind of like I mean it's fine like it's fine but it doesn't do much for me I guess I feel it's too easy it's too easily earned by the end of it it's like okay these people are together good for them but they didn't overcome that many things and the overcoming later yes the overcoming part is the meat of your story so I wish I could tell you like how to do it but there's really I don't know <laughs> I don't know how you do it you just start with those principles in mind and then you write it a gazillion and times. then you stop and then you send it in yeah and then you get you get the note that you need to rewrite it <laughs> And then you do 18 that. times from what I hear. <laughs> yeah. And then you just cry. I'm just yeah, you have a very harsh editor. You should talk to them. <laughs> oh, she is great. She was great. She saved that book for me. It was not the first thing that I turned in. It wasn't good. It wasn't good. <laughs> it wasn't. I, you know, I wrote it when I was pregnant and I had a newborn. Ugh. It wasn't good. There was no way it was going to be good. The fact that I thought <laughs> it was going to be good just showed that I was not in their correct headspace. <laughs> oh, <how> could it be? <laughs> and so, no, I love Bethany House. They were very gracious to me as I figured out the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And you do, and 
any of the Bethany people, if you're listening, I joke. Your editors are amazing, so don't, please don't take offense by that. So, and you know, this book is as example of that. So, and I actually have a question here. Somebody sent in. Um, they want to know how much input you had on this cover, and they're right. This I can't point. I'm always going backwards. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. I know. You know what? I um so what Bethany House does, at least for my books, um, they send you like a little questionnaire. Okay. And it sort of asks you, like, you know, what colors did you think about? Like, you know, it, it gets it just picks your brain of like, you know, okay. what do you think the cover would look like or what what's uh what are important symbols in the book or um you know, what are their names? Describe the people. So just giving them any kind of like physical anything. And I think probably what inspired that, well, what's actually kind of funny about that is the concept was different when they designed that cover. She wasn't an interior designer. She was a food photographer. Oh, interesting. Plate made a little more sense it still works perfectly fine. Um, yeah. but yeah, that was kind of just a funny serendipitous thing. Um, I knew like my suggestions were primarily in the realm of like torn stuff or collages. I was kind of thinking like, you know, designers make like mood boards. So like that, but kind of like ripped and stuff like that, sort of like what Georgina makes in the cottage, that big thing. Um, that's yeah. sort of what I was thinking. I had vision boards on there. And so I love like the more abstract thing that they came up with, with this. Um, I think, it, yeah, like you said, it's beautiful. Colors are beautiful. It, it's weirdly kind of like sort of fits with after she falls. They're two totally different, but like when they're next to each other, they yeah. exist in the same family. Um, the handwriting font that I like. So Bethany does beautiful, beautiful work on all the covers. And yeah. that, that one, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, but I think it's one of the best, in my opinion. It is, it is gorgeous. It's very, very eye-catching on the shelf, whether, you know, sitting here with other books or, you know, in a group of itself, it's yeah. very eye-catching. So yeah. oh, on those lines, I'm going to ask a question somebody sent in. Do you get to pick the titles for your books or did you? Uh, I picked Pretty Little Pieces. Okay. I guess I, I, well, I shouldn't say I picked them. I, uh, I thought of it. I thought of um, multiple choices and then they pick okay. out of those multiple ones. Yes. And after she falls, um, after she falls was the second title. The first one was oh. Coronet, um, which was too abstract. No one okay. knows. Fair enough. <laughs> Bethany House knows what they're doing. So <laughs> you give them choices and then they pick based off of their robust knowledge of what readers are going to like. Awesome. And then somebody else asked, what inspires you? Oh. And that's, that's the question. That's the so question. I don't, oh, I'm assuming in your writing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what inspires me in my writing? Um, well, I love personally the intersection of romance, women's fiction and faith. I think that's a really interesting mix of things. That's what I go for. Um, if someone were to pitch me books and they're like, it's women's fiction, romance, faith, I'd be like, I'm interested. Tell me more. Um, so I'm inspired by those three things. I like all of them individually. I like the idea of them together even more because I think I think that's the the female experience and the male experience too, but obviously we're unique in how we think about things. Um, and I think most women the issues that are raised in women's fiction are really important. It's usually questions of like identity and, you know, just sort of your place in the world. And then romance. I think most women care about romance. I Most of the ones that I know, <laughs> they like it, they're into it. They spend a lot of time thinking about it. And then faith. Um, and faith is one that's increasingly neglected. Um, but I think we're all spiritual beings. And I think, obviously, I think that Jesus is God. And I think looking into the questions that he raised and the answers that he gave, I think those, I mean, in my own life, I just have clear evidence of how that has 
transformed me and not in like this linear perfect way i think sometimes we really pigeonhole christians into like you became a christian and then you became a good person and that's not really like that's not that's not it i became a christian and i became a better person than i was <laughs> i'm still not a good person like you know like i have my moments but i am very much a sinner um but christianity gives me a framework where I can make sense of things and I can have hope. Um, so that definitely inspires me. And then obviously love my readers. I'm motivated for them um, to write good stories. And my kiddos, my my daughters are old enough now where they're all excited that mom's a writer and that's inspiring. On the days when it's hard, it's like a good motivator. So hopefully, yeah. Good. And then somebody was wondering, since you kind of brought it up, um, what are you reading now or are you looking forward to reading soon? Oh, that's a good question. Um, what am I reading now? Right now, I'm trying to just read my Bible. <laughs> trying to just do that. Step one. Um, I have three kiddos, five, three, and one. And, you know, obviously having them and then writing two books in two years was crazy. Don't recommend it. Don't recommend okay. it at all. I recommend. I will, I will put that down as things not to do. I recommend okay. having babies. I recommend writing books. I do not recommend doing them at the exact same time. <laughs> um, yeah, my TBR took a hit. I, but, you know, I get lots of free books from Bethany House. Beautiful, lovely books that call to me all the time. I've got um, Kim Duffy's new book, The Weight of Air. Have you read it? I have just started it. Yeah, I'm sure that I am fascinated with those characters. Here, we're going to talk about somebody else's books. That's just silly. But I'm fascinated by the characters already. The premise, if you like the circus, strong women, historical romance, I think it's going to be cool. I love Jamie Jo Wright. I would love to read some of her books. She's wonderful and been a fantastic um, endorser and cheerleader of me. Um, obviously we write very different things, but I'm really interested. I, I think it's super cool that she's doing the intersection of like suspense and paranormal stuff and all the, and faith. Like, I think that's yeah. cool. Um, so those are two, you know, like if I could dive in, if I had the time, that's what I would do. And one day I will, one day yeah. I will, you know, I believe yeah. I'm holding out. <laughs> Like, I had to wait for my kids to get older too, because people are, oh, what are you reading? Well, um, some sort of piggy and elephant or Dr. Seuss. Or, yeah. Well, and they oh. just like trash your books. At least mine do. If I have a physical book out, they will just like, it's gone. Oh, yeah. I got to do audio. That's a library book. Why did you bend the pages? I know. Or drop it in the bathtub. Yeah. Smear peanut butter. Like, there's just no hope for that. So I keep, this is real. I should take a picture and post it sometime. I have a book closet. I have a closet that is just full of like my books for things, for events, and then like bookmarks and swag and merch. And then all of these other books that were like given to me or signed or whatever. And it's just this beautiful curated little closet where they're safe. <laughs> it's sad. It's sad that and they're neglected. Those little benches in there so you can shut the door. <laughs> they're untouched but it looks so beautiful and one day I will dive in I'm sure <laughs> the children do get older then you can read again yeah so. and that's bittersweet too my oldest yeah. is gonna be five at the end of the month and I can't believe it I feel like I gave birth to her yesterday so I'm yeah. like how are that you doesn't get any better even when they're well you know 40 <laughs> I know. Well, you know, I take pictures of them now sometimes and I can like see what they're going to look like kind of. And I'm like, wow, you're like yeah. on the fast track. Stop there's it. that, there's that one time when, yeah, you take a picture or something and they just look older and it like takes your breath away. Like, yeah. no, you're, you're young yet. Stop it. Yeah. I, I remember that happening a couple of times with my kids and it, you know, it's just something simple, the way they look over their shoulder at you or something. And then it's like, no, no. You're only five. Stop it. I know. Well, I try to walk that fine balance of like letting them know how much I love like their cuteness, but also telling them it's okay to grow up. You know, I don't want to. Yeah. I, I remember having little, I'm the youngest in my family. Ah. I call it it. Uh, my sister's 10 years older than I am. My brother's seven years older than I am. So oh. my parents were all about me being the baby. And I legitimately felt bad about growing up. 
<laughs> I felt like I'm like, oh, I'm making them sad because I'm getting older. And that's not what they ever meant to communicate to me, you know, but like, oh. so try to communicate. I try to tell my kids, like, my job is to help you grow up. And it's yeah. a good, we'll be friends. We're friends now. We'll be friends later and sort of yeah. give them yeah. to feel like, you know, that's just how it goes. You're cute. Yeah. Daddy, but- you raise your children to let them go. Yep. Somebody told me that one time and it's like, oh, you're right. By the way, my sister is 10 years younger than I am. And we have a brother who is seven years older than her. Are oh. you in my family? <laughs> I'm your sister. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I'm your baby sister, Chris. <laughs> you? It's the black hair threw me off. None of us have that color. <laughs> we all have this gray now. So, so one of the things I got to get to this before we run out of time is yeah. I got to know how much and what kind of research did you do for the DIY show? Yeah. Because it was so interesting because there were so many details in there that, okay, how'd you find them out? That's hard. It was really hard to do. They oh. lock those things up. Like it's a deep dive into the internet. That's how you figure it out. Um, wow. Yeah. And actually what really helped me, this is so random, but helpful. I mean, obviously God, God orchestrated it. So when I was in graduate school, which is eight years ago. Um, is that right? Yeah, something like that. I was or nine years ago. I was in graduate school and we had a guest writer come and she had written a short story. And you know, when you're in graduate school, you're like required to go to the events with the guest writers and you have to listen and ask questions and all of that. And usually I did not like them. This one I thought was actually pretty good. And her story was all about um, reality TV. It was from the perspective of a producer on a reality television show. And it was just this short little snippet, but it was really interesting because it would bring up things like, uh, they would spray paint leaves so that it would look like a certain season or they would like change clocks and just like stuff. That was the first time listening to her read her story that I ever thought about like, oh yeah, you know, probably on reality television shows, they have to do all these weird things because it's not actually real. You know, they're working with a artificial timeline. So that was the first time that was ever planted in my mind where I was like, huh, I bet there's all kinds of weird tricks like that. And then, you know, fast forward to now, like I said, I read a lot of the magazines. I watch the shows. So some of it was just me reasoning through it of like, you know, what realistically, Once I figured out their timeline, which that's somewhat easy to find, different shows have different timelines, but the average, you know, DIY show operates on some scale. I thought about like, okay, so if we have this amount of time and we have this many people, realistically, how fast would they have to do things and how much of a crew would they have and this and that. But a lot of it too is just me. I just made it up (laughs) like because like on those shows, they sign away, like you sign away your ability to say anything about those shows. Like, especially if you're a contestant on the more like the bachelor and stuff, those people cannot talk about certain things because to be on the show, they agree that, you know, like this is, this is all kept under lock and key. So in that case, like I could find some things and then other things I just had to be like, well, what's, we know that for we know that for television networks it's about money so i need to just think through how are they going to get the most for their money and that's realistically what they would do and that's kind of how i came up with it and here i thought you're going to tell me i went to graduate school and joanna Gaines before she got married was in my class so i just <laughs> called her oh but you know this i guess this is interesting maybe <laughs> i did apply to be on a couple reality television shows um i didn't get on them but there was one that the only reason I applied to be on it was because Sylvester Stallone produced it. And I thought I was going to be able to meet Sylvester Stallone. That was the whole goal. <laughs> and the, it was you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> do, you gotta do. And it was one of those crazy, like American Ninja Warrior shows where I would have died. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah he did like, that one, didn't he, for a little while. Yep. And so I tried to get on that. So I sort of knew, I knew what questions they asked you when you applied. And I remember a guy called me from California and was like, you know, have you ever 
have you ever been in the Olympics? Like they had all these like questions. It's like, no, I just want to meet Sylvester Stallone. That's yeah. pretty Can cool. you make that happen? I don't really want to be on your show. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to die on your obstacle course. <laughs> Yeah, but I will sport <laughs> ones, man. I don't know how anybody survives that. So. Nope. nope. So that's my foray into reality television. That's as deep. Oh, as it's further than mine. I always look at those going, yeah, unless you're going to come and redo my house. I don't want you anywhere near me. So. Um, <laughs> so as we are getting closer to the end here, first, what's up for you next? Well, nothing like official. You know, I can't, okay. I can't speak of official matters, but I can tell yep. you that I have a new book concept and it is going to be very different from my other two. It's like how I roll. I like to just change it up. If I spend a long time on one project, I want to go do a different, different world, different people, different everything. And the idea for this one is going to be a modern take on the classic telenovela. So if you're familiar with telenovelas, you know, yeah. very dramatic Spanish soap operas that are like known for being over the top and ridiculous. And so I want to take some of like the fun of those, but like ground it with like real people and a real situation. Um, and it will be in Little Havana, Miami. So in the Cuban world, I'm going to draw on my experience with my own family, um, which, you know, for the... For a while now, well, there's not very many of them left in, in Miami, but there was. I grew up visiting um, my little extended Cuban family, and just it's just a very cool culture that I think more people would probably like to learn about in this very candid, fun, you know, real person kind of way. And it will be, it would be a contemporary romance like the other two. So very grounded with the romance, but Cuban mafia, little Havana, telenovelas. Yeah, we're going, we're going for it. Just yeah. It oh, that sounds like fun. I will look forward to it. Hopefully it will become official soon. So, yeah, we, um, we, we pray. Yes, yes. So good. So where do people find you? Are you on Facebook, Instagram? What's your website address? All that fun stuff. Yes. Thank you for asking. I'm on all the things. You can find me on Facebook. It's just my name, Carmen Schober, S-C-H-O-B-E-R. Um, I'm also on Instagram. Instagram is my personal favorite. So if you like okay. talk to me on a more regular basis, I check Instagram more than I check Facebook. Um, my website is the best way to get consistent updates. You know, we all follow things on Facebook and who knows if you actually ever see anything from the people that you follow. So you should definitely subscribe to my newsletter. And my website okay. is my name, carmenshoper.com. Yeah, you know, I think if you type my name into Google, it should all be there. <laughs> in theory you should all be there i'm not i'm not too hard to reach and i love emailing from the government or anything no not yet <laughs> um yeah and i love to talk to readers so if you if you want to chat if you have questions about writing books any of it um oh and i will be at some events um the mississippi river writers retreat i'll be at that yeah that's in august I think it's in July. July? I should, I should know. I should know that too, but now I don't remember. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Gabriel. I should yeah. have known too. Sorry. But anyways, how exciting though. Yeah, I'll get that. I'm very excited about that. And there's another one I'm forgetting. I'll be at ACFW again. Yeah. That'll be fun. Um, yeah. So yeah. And I'm based in Kansas. If anybody with, with Sarah Brunsvold and Amanda Wynn, we're the Kansas coalition out here. So any Awesome. Yep, awesome. Right. I'll have to get the Kansas or the Kansas coalition to come to the store all together. Yes. Be a fun so I know. Yeah. Just to bask in the in in Sarah's presence with that amazing book, right? <laughs> no kidding. I'm like, I can hardly wait for her next one. So yeah. but yeah, that was one of those. And one of my best friends who had passed away in 2020, her name was Mrs. Kip. Her that was her literally her last name. And it was like, I looked at that book going, I'm not sure I'm ever going to read this book. And I'm so glad I did. So that's crazy. But, that's isn't that weird? Yep. Yeah. So yeah. it was very, very good. And I had talked to Sarah about it at after I'd read it. But 
Yeah, yeah, at the time. Yeah, Sarah's wonderful. We actually um, road tripped to ACFW together. Me, her, and her mom. It was a great time. Oh, how fun. Yep. <laughs> Good All time. Right. Had some Taco Bell. It was awesome. Loved it. I got the celebrity experience with yeah, Sarah. Because everybody's like, Sarah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure they did that for you too. So, uh, had a few more than I thought. It's just very surreal, very cool. You know, I'm, I'm excited and honored literally anytime anyone yeah. says anything about a book that I, you know, like it's just, it feels, it feels uh, like a, like an honor every single time. So, thank you That's for having awesome. me. Oh. And for Again, it's just always a, always fun to talk to you in real life and on the screen. I do actually feel like sometimes I get done talking to you, like I swear we're related. I really do. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm your sister. I'm your. You're right. I forgot. I keep forgetting. You know, I'm getting old now. I forget things like my sister. So, <laughs> Shree is going to be very surprised. But yeah, surprise! Here I am. There you go. Oh, yeah, I thought you were the baby. Ha <laughs> ha. So. <laughs> It's me. Okay, now we're getting silly. So we but, gotta but, we gotta let Yeah, we gotta wrap up here. I would like to go on and then we would really get silly. So let's not do that. So but thank you for joining me tonight. It was such a pleasure talking to you. Um I look forward to your next book um and hearing more from you and seeing you here and there and everywhere. So um so thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Baker Bookhouse. Love it. Every single time. Always a pleasure. I'm sure we'll do it again soon. I hope so. <laughs> thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I am going to do a very personal thing here and she's going to shut me off early, but um, I want to say thank you very much to Becky. Um, she is leaving Baker for bigger and better things, um, but I am going to miss her greatly. Um, she is very good at making me look good and um, I really appreciate her time with the Baker. Um, blessings to you on your next journey, Becky. Um, but thank you all for joining us and we will see you again soon. Bye now. <laughs>